You know, I was driving here and I, I was I was riding down the road and I, I passed that cemetery on the bottom of the hill. It was a a reminder that we're not here for long. The mortality that exists in the season, right? Ash Wednesday, from ashes you have come, to ashes you shall return. It's all around us in this season. But we have opportunities every single week to reflect and repent and restore and ultimately renew. So thank you for taking a step and being in this place, in this moment. God ordained for you to be here. Why don't you pray with me? Oh, giving and gracious God, we thank you so much for this moment. God, I ask that you be in the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart that your grace might continue to pour down upon this community of faith, that we might grow even one step closer to you. And all of God's people proclaim together. Amen. Amen. Okay, we made it this far. We're four Sundays into Lent, right? And we're going to continue on this sermon series. It's a sermon series that will explore the premise and the promise that God makes to us. Don't you feel a little bit closer to God already? I certainly do. I certainly do. Because God's love, it's unending. And it's uncompromising in the way that God holds us and forgives us. In the way that God never turns a back on us. No matter what. No matter what temptation comes our way. No matter what trials we face. No matter how we thirst. No matter how we're lost. And ultimately, no matter how we fail, God is right there beside us. The God of light that promises to be there even in the hardest of times, even in the darkest of days, to never leave our side. How lucky are we to serve that God? And thus far, we've, we've dived into the trials and the temptation of Jesus, right? The very first Sunday, we explored the temptation and its corrupting power on our spirits. And last week, we dove into thirst about how we are spiritually dehydrated and how that dehydration robs us of being our true selves, of being our best selves. The fact that we are all thirsting for more of the divine. But this week, we read in the scriptures, we're in for a doozy, okay? Have you ever been lost? Raise your hand if you've been lost before. I'm talking maybe as a kid in a grocery store or a mall. To find an employee to, to call for your parents over the intercom. <laughs> or maybe on a hike out in the woods where you've been so absorbed with the nature that you've found your way off the beaten path. And suddenly you look up and where am I? And you have to aimlessly wander and try to find something that's vaguely familiar to make your way back. We've all been lost, right? It's not a good feeling, especially when you're really, really lost. When you're a kid and you're, you're, you're alone in that grocery store and you don't know where mom or dad or grandma is, it's not a great feeling. And I say feeling, but if we're honest about it, it's not a feeling, it's an amalgamation of feelings, so many good feelings. I mean, not only do you feel helpless, like you're not in control of your current predicament, but you probably feel scared and anxious nervous, and maybe even paralyzed. For some, your mind starts to wander and go to awful scenarios. And fear starts to cling to your every thought. And for others who might find themselves more optimistic, every moment that optimism starts to wane a little bit. And anxiety starts to creep in a little bit. It's not a good feeling. Not at all. And I can tell you, anyone who's been lost, all of us, would say it's not a desirable experience. But on the flip side, as a parent, as a grandparent, as a sibling, as a partner, I can imagine the idea of losing someone that you're responsible for is not an ideal situation either, right? I mean, you might feel those exact same emotions. 
terrified, helpless, anxious, incredibly nervous, right? And then let's sprinkle on a little bit of shame and some guilt. Oh no, I've lost this person that I was responsible for. It's not a good feeling to be lost. And I too have been a lost sheep before. A, a number of years ago, I, I vividly remember a, a trip I took as a college student to Chicago, a wonderful city. And uh, it was a winter mission trip, and we went to surf. Uh, about 20 college students. And we worked with an organization, and they like to describe their, their ministry as an immersive experience. And boy, was it immersive. By day, I spent the days in inner city middle school doing one-on-one -on -one sessions with kids that were kicked out of class because they couldn't follow the rules, they couldn't focus. And in that space, I was in my own. I was completely comfortable. I can do that all day. But by night, by night we were sent out into the community to work in food banks and homeless shelters. And one night I remember by the way that it shaped me, we were to engage in a night out on the town in a truly immersive experience. We were sent out in groups of three with five dollars to feed ourselves. And we were given a rendezvous point to meet up at some point much later in the evening. It's January in Chicago. And so we get on the L and we, we, we ride on this train from the western side of Chicago into the central city. And I don't know if you've ever ridden a train or a bus in a place that you are completely and utterly unfamiliar with. Where do you get off? <laughs> what am I doing? Where am I going? I don't know. And so naturally, we're on this train and we see lights. And so, okay, it's time to get off. But by the time you've seen the lights and you've seen the place that you want to get off, You've already passed it on a train. So naturally, we get off several stops away from where we needed to. And I don't know if you've ever been to a large city, but the further you get away from the main drag, the sketchier it gets. And so we get off the train, and immediately upon exiting, I knew we made a poor decision. I looked around, and... I didn't see any lights, I didn't see any people, I didn't see any businesses that were open. And I could see that we were potentially in some trouble. Three suburban Missouri kids trying to find our way around inner city Chicago. But, naturally, like the, the smart, young, enterprising people that we were, we managed to navigate our way through dark alleys, twisting and turning, and finally, after some time, we made our way to the main track. And I don't know if you've been in Chicago at nighttime, even in January, but there are masses of people everywhere. It's like people are wallpaper. And everywhere you look, they're there. And if you're anything like me, crowds are not your place. There's something about a crowd that just makes my brain shut down. And my navigation certainly does not work in a crowd. And so with this energy, we trekked on. And I remember the experience as a wonderful experience. Uh, the, the whole point of the experience was that we would spend some time getting to feel like what, what it meant to live on the street. Five dollars to spend amongst three people, three grown people. You couldn't even buy a meal for five dollars in that area. And yet we had to scrape and scrounge and make something work and feed ourselves. And on top of that, it's January in Chicago and the cold is blowing right through our coats. Because we have Chicago coats, we have Missouri coats. Not made for that bitter wind, and our bones are shaking in the cold of Chicago, standing for hours and hours on the street, no warmth 
to be found. It's a wonderful experience. But all experiences have to end. And of course, I was looking forward to the end of it. But there was a little piece that we had to meet at this rendezvous point, and me and a crowd, not a good navigator. And of course, I was the navigator for our group. And so we journey on to, towards our rendezvous point, and we make some wrong turns. And we have to stop, and we have to replot. We have to start again. But I tell you, 20 minutes after we were supposed to be there, we did make it to our destination. And what a relief it was to finally be where I was supposed to be and know where I was and be safe. I made it to home base. And I realized in that moment what a weight, that feeling of being lost, that feeling of uncertainty, is not just on our brains, but on our spirits. It's like my whole being breathed a sigh of relief. And how perfect is it for Jesus to give us this parable? This parable of the lost son, one that most of us are familiar with in one way or another, but one that I think a lot of us misinterpret. A story of a father's love a story of a lost sheep. A story of true and unadulterated grace. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. Fill in the blank there. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen in that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. But no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And so he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father said to him, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran, he ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. But meanwhile, the older son was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied. And your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back, safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, after all of these years I have been slaving for you and never, ever disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even one young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. 
my son, Father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. What a story. It's a story that we're familiar with. But to understand, to truly understand, you have to dive a little bit deeper. You have to understand what's happening. In the beginning of this story, the young son comes to his father and he requests his share of the estate. Now, it's easy just to read that and just move along to the juicy bits later on in the text. But you have to understand the significance of that. This young man came to his father and with the ultimate slap in the face said, Dad, I want my inheritance now. He said, Dad, why don't you just die so I can have my inheritance? How would you respond to that? But this father, with grace, grants his son's request. And like most people and most young people who are given a large chunk of money, what does his son do? He blows it. He blows it on all the worldly things and experiences that he coveted. And coming out of that stupor, he finds himself in a world in famine where he needs some of that money. But it's not there. And so what does he do? He goes looking for a job. And at this time, that means being a servant of another man. And as described in the text, this is not a good job. He gets sent out to go work with the pigs. And it's so bad that he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. But no one gave him anything. He was so hungry that he was ready to eat pig food. Sounds delicious, right? You can only imagine what he was eating in that time. And in this level of distress where he's literally starving, no one cared. There was no one there to give him anything or help him at all. And the text says, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. This is the emergence of a rock bottom moment, right? The young son realizes as he's looking at this pig food and craving this pig food, this is rock bottom. And he decides, I am unworthy of the love of my father. But I am willing to spend the rest of my life working off that debt. But this father, this great, great father has other ideas for his son. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Now, you may not be familiar, but at this time, men didn't run. Didn't do it. There was no jogging. There was no sprinting. Men didn't run. Yet the father sees his lost son in the distance and sprints to his son. Not to listen to his son's plea for help or apology, but to embrace his son and welcome him back. The son tries. He says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. Blah, blah, blah. But the father says, whoa, I want to hear it. Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Bring a ring on his finger. Bring, bring sandals for his feet. Let's kill the fatted calf. Let's celebrate and have a party. My son has arisen from the dead. What grace, what love and mercy by a father. And that's an easy place to stop. But it doesn't stop there. Now we come to meet the older brother with a heart filled with hatred and jealousy. 
Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what was going on. Your brother has come. He replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. So the older brother became angry, and he refused to even go in. So the father came out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all of these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never even gave me a young goat so I can celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him, this son of yours, his brother. And with the ultimate grace, what grace of a father to say this to his oldest son. My son, the father said, you are always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. When we hear this story, it is a familiar and pleasing story to us because we see ourselves in the prodigal son that we might choose to step out into the world, that we might bite off a little bit more than we can chew, that we might be tempted and tried, that we might be lost somewhere on the road. But ultimately, even after all of that, we might find our way home and be embraced by a father that loves us that we might return forgiven and free. Or maybe even we hear this story and we see ourselves in a father. That we might lose a loved one to the pleasures of the world. And that we might anxiously await their return and receive them as such. And that's fair. That's a fair interpretation. We're all sinners. And we all stray. We've already talked about we've all been lost. And you might not have been lost in this way yet. But mark my words, you will be. We all sin. We all become lost. It's a byproduct of free will. You will sin, and through sin, you'll become lost. There's this famous quote that theologians throw around about sin. Sin will take you farther and you want to go keep you longer than you want to stay and cost you more than you want to pay. Boy, is it true. But what we don't see in this scripture, where we don't see ourselves, is that the lost one is not the prodigal son. The lost one is the oldest son. Yes, this is a story that's meant to mimic and mirror our relationship with God. That we might lose ourselves, but we might repent and be welcomed back into the loving embrace of God. It's true. But just as much as the story is about that, it's a cautionary tale. Not only can we lose ourselves to the world, but we can lose ourselves to so-called faith. You see, this older brother could no longer see the worth in his brother. He didn't see him as worthy of love or of grace or of mercy or even of compassion. All he could see was a father that was ungrateful and unappreciative of his work and his sacrifice. And what we don't acknowledge is that just as much as we are the prodigal son, we are the older brother. We curse the God that loves us when we don't get our way. We are constantly comparing the worthiness of others 
to our own. Based on our faith, based on our service, but in this parable, Jesus spends the time on that. It is not the self-righteous son that is celebrated, but the one who failed and fell to his knees. Pride is the devil we ignore. We fail as Christians when we focus only on ourselves because we become so consumed with justice and equity in our lives that we no longer advocate for justice and equity in the lives of others. We get so comfortable in the dark that we don't even recognize the absence of light. But when we recognize the lost parts within us, we can truly start to see ourselves and all of those around us. Romans 3 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Each and every one of us falls short. But what we do in response to falling, that is what determines who we shall become. How we respond to sin determines who we are inside. Not only does sin have consequences, but also each time we sin, we reinforce a pattern that becomes harder and harder to break. And if we persist in sin with the thought that one day we will get right with God, we should remind ourselves that God may still be there to forgive and restore, but we may not be. We are all lost in one way or another, experiencing that tangled web of emotions, crippling our spirits. But it is up to us when we fall to our knees and allow ourselves to be welcomed back into the fold of God. <clears throat> or if we shall continue to wander. For I know the plans. I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. That you will call on me and come to me and pray to me. And I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Declares the Lord. Thanks be to God.